Okay, welcome everybody on YouTube. I want to give our second video on the ellipsoid algorithm. So we're solving a linear programming problem with the ellipsoid algorithm, but in sort of a complicated way. We're really just finding if a linear program has a feasible solution or not. And as I sort of touched upon in the last video, you can recast that as finding whether a linear programming problem contains an epsilon ball as a feasible solution or not. So our inputs to the ellipsoid algorithm are uh, a matrix, capital A, and a vector B. And we're trying to decide um, if you know, this feasible region contains an epsilon ball or not. Our other two inputs are epsilon and R. We're assuming that our feasible region is contained inside this large enough ball. And um, yeah, and we're trying to decide if, if the feasible region has an entire epsilon ball worth of solutions. In practice, R and epsilon are determined in terms of the, the input size of matrix A and vector B. Okay, so as as the entries of the matrix A and vector B get bigger and bigger, capital R is getting bigger and bigger, and epsilon is getting smaller and smaller. So what's our output? If the feasible region where AX is at most B contains an epsilon ball, you return a point to the feasible region. That's, that's your goal. If not, if you don't contain an epsilon ball, you return no solution or this implementation will, will, might return a point, okay? But in practice, when you set up your inputs correctly, right, this is the feasible region will apply the simplex, the, the ellipsoid method on. And in practice, if it has any solution, then it has indeed a full epsilon ball solution. So roughly speaking, what we're gonna do is we're gonna generate a sequence of ellipsoids, all of which contain our possible empty feasible region, you know, but sorry, really we're trying to decide if our feasible region could contain an epsilon ball or not. So let's see, our first ellipsoid is gonna be the ball itself that we were given as one of our inputs containing the feasible region. And we're going to keep finding further and further ellipsoids of smaller and smaller volume that contain our feasible region. If ever the center of our ellipsoid is inside the feasible region, then we'll have succeeded, right? We'll have returned a point in the feasible region. And if the feasible region doesn't contain a ball of size epsilon, eventually we're going to get down to an ellipsoid that, that doesn't contain as much volume as a ball of size epsilon. And, but since that ellipsoid contains the feasible region, we'll know that the feasible region doesn't have an epsilon ball inside of it. Okay, so what does the iterative step look like? We start with this outside ball as our initial ellipse. So if, if our current ball happened, if our current ellipsoid happened to have its center inside the feasible region, just return that center, we're done. Otherwise, we're gonna choose a new smaller ellipse of less volume, still containing the feasible region. Okay, so epsilon k is our current ellipsoid. and we're gonna produce epsilon k plus one, our next one. So we look at the center S sub k of our current ellipsoid. Is it inside the feasible region? If so, we turn that point, we're done. If not, there's some constraint separating it from the feasible region, right? So this is maybe some boundary segment of, of the feasible region. What we do is we take that constraint and we translate it to actually go through the point, okay? So 
So this might be part of the boundary of our, of our polytope P, our feasible region. But we use the direction of that constraint and just pass it through the center. The, the next ellipse is going to be obtained as follows. So previously, we knew that our feasible region had to be inside our current ellipse. Okay. Moreover, you have to be on this side, the correct side of this constraint, which means you have to be on the correct side of this line. Okay, so we've reduced the, the area that could contain the feasible region down to um, what our book calls H sub K, this bit. Right. Moreover, we know that the feasible region is in this bit, okay, but it's simpler to implement this method if you use a, a slightly weaker constraint going through the center of the ellipse. So since the current feasible region has to be in this bit, our next ellipse is going to be the smallest ellipse containing our current you know, bounds on where the feasible region will be. So this ellipse epsilon k plus one is chosen so that it's tangent to this region hk in the right spots. All right, in summary, we're at an ellipse epsilon e sub k. Its center is not in the feasible region, but it, this ellipse contains a feasible region. Since the center is not in the feasible region, there's some constraint separating it from the feasible region. You could use that constraint, but it's easier to implement if you just translate that constraint to make it slightly weaker going through the center. So now the feasible region has to be inside here this uh, area HK. So we find the smallest ellipse containing HK, and that's our next ellipse in the algorithm. If we ever find an ellipse whose volume is smaller than that of an epsilon ball, then we're done, because we know the feasible region doesn't contain an epsilon ball. And, and that's the entire algorithm. Start with the outer ball, find these successively smaller and smaller ellipses. If the center of an ellipse ever is inside the feasible region, return it, you found a solution. And if you ever get to a, down to ellipses of too small a volume, you know, there's no epsilon ball. Roughly speaking, why is this a polynomial time algorithm? If you can prove that the ratio of the volumes from one ellipse to the next is sufficiently small. So the ellipses are getting small enough at a, at a fast enough rate that you only have to take a polynomial number of steps, polynomial in terms of n, the number of variables, and, um, and the input size parameters. Questions? Yeah, um, in the iterative step, we're finding a constraint that separates uh, SK from the feasible region. Um, yeah. Do we have to like worry about cases where there may be multiple constraints that are sort of separating SK from the feasible region? Or can we just pick one arbitrarily? Exactly, you nailed it. Pick one arbitrarily. Yeah, there might be many constraints, you know, separating our, our current solution from this feasible region and just pick any one of them. Yeah. All right, so let me talk about some more advanced comments or subtleties about this algorithm. Um, I mean, now that you've seen it, you can probably see why you don't want to implement it in practice or why it might be slow in practice, right? This is an algorithm that proves something runs in polynomial time, but it's one of those algorithms that nobody wants to like, touch or code up. Although maybe I'm a little too strong on that. People do use the ellipsoid method to solve nonlinear programs. 
Okay, so some subtleties and more advanced comments. You actually don't want to compute this next ellipse exactly. So, you know, you don't want to compute this next ellipse that's like tangent exactly, just because that involves square roots and then you run into linear or to numerical, um, numerical issues. So instead, you're going to find a slightly larger ellipse that has rational parameters. Another subtlety, and I don't fully know why this is a problem, but I can make guesses. Let's say this same constraint is the constraint that we keep using to separate our um, current center from the feasible region over and over again. Okay, If we keep using this constraint, then our ellipses start to get narrower and narrower. And this can also cause problems. I'm not exactly sure why, but I could imagine for reasons of numerical stability. And so to account for this problem, what people have to do is they have to find ways to sort of truncate ellipses that get too narrow. Cut off, cut off this part. OK. Um, another comment is, why did we use ellipsoids? Ellipsoids could really be replaced with any rich enough family of convex sets. You want your family to be rich enough so that if I draw, you know, my convex feasible region, you know, I can get down to uh, uh, an ellipsoid that contains that region, but not too much more area. Right? You want your family to be rich enough so that you can really approximate any convex region as well. But you could use things like simplices instead of ellipsoids if you want in this algorithm. You know, your ellipsoids are just serving as these approximation tools and you get better and better approximations in a polynomial way. Cool comment. So Lander really touched on this. You might have many um, constraints separating your current solution from the feasible region P. Okay. Any constraint you choose will work. Furthermore, in a very real sense, you don't so much need to implement this algorithm. You don't really even need to know the definition of your feasible region. All you need is an oracle where you can ask your oracle, hey, my current center point is not in the feasible region, is it? And they say yes or no, whether it's in the feasible region. And if not, the oracle just gives you some constraint separating your current center point from the feasible region. That's all we needed in our algorithm was an oracle that said like, aha, is this point in the feasible region or not? If not, give me any separator. That allows you to run this algorithm when you actually have a programming problem that has, for example, infinitely many constraints, right? You could have infinitely many constraints and still have an oracle that when you're not in the feasible region, uh, returns some separator. Where this comes up and where the ellipsoid method is actually used in practice is sometimes in semi-definite programming. So what is that? Variable x is no longer a vector, it's a matrix. Okay, it's still just a list of real numbers, but we shape it as a matrix instead of a vector. And then it's called semi-definite programming because you constrain this square matrix to be positive semi-definite. You know, one definition of, of a um, symmetric square matrix being positive semi-definite is that when you look at all of its real eigenvalues, those real eigenvalues are all positive. Okay, so it's some constraint in terms of like eigenvalues. But an equivalent formulation of that is that for any vector A, when you take this sort of 
quadratic form, A transpose times your matrix times A, you get a real number. And if your matrix X is positive semi-definite, then for any vector A, this real number is always non-negative. Okay, so this is really an infinite family of constraints. X is positive semi-definite if and only if this equation is true for all vectors A, all right? So you can run the ellipsoid method here where you have this infinite set of constraints. And if your um, current matrix is not yet in the feasible region, if it's not positive semi-definite, your oracle gives you some separator, you know, which is determined by some uh, vector A violating Questions? Thanks so much.